Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Wednesday, August the 26th. Uh, I did make a mistake when I told you guys that Article 4 in the Apology of the Augsburg Confession is the longest article. I had forgotten that Article 5 is actually the longest article and it's like 30 pages. So we're just going to do a few paragraphs a day until we're done with it and keep moving. Uh, but the Apology is the longest part of the uh, Book of Concord, so... Uh, you've been warned. <laughs> Maybe break up evening prayer into a couple pieces if it's uh, too long. Or uh, read it on your own. Because uh, the, the Apology has got a lot of good stuff in it, a lot of important things in it, uh, but it is, it is very long. So I apologize for that in advance. Let's go ahead and begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun and we look to the evening light. We sing to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty, grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. How precious is your steadfast love, O God! The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. O continue your steadfast love to those who know you, and your righteousness to the upright of heart. Let not the foot of arrogance come upon me, nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. There the evildoers lie fallen, they are thrust down, unable to rise. Our New Testament reading tonight is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus, and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Through our outer, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And our Book of Concord reading tonight is the uh, 
conclusion of Article 4 on justification from the Apology. The Church Fathers affirm this teaching. Editor's note, in the Apology, Melanchthon strongly refutes the Roman Church's understanding of faith, drawing on examples from Scripture and the Church Fathers. The Roman Church teaches that grace is infused into the human soul. Man cooperates with this infused grace to produce certain virtues, faith being among them. By freely assenting to the doctrines of the Roman Church, one demonstrates faith. This view of faith reduces God's gracious supernatural gift to a, more, a mere initiating power. It also diminishes personal faith in Christ to simple agreement with the teachings of the Church. Instead of heartfelt trust in our gracious God and Savior, faith becomes mere intellectual assent to the history of Jesus. The Church Fathers affirm this teaching. Here and there among the fathers, similar testimonies exist, for Ambrose says in his letter to a certain Irenaeus, Furthermore, the world was subject to God by the law because, according to the command of the law, all are indicted, and yet by the works of the law no one is justified. For, by the law, sin is perceived, but guilt is not taken away. The law, which declared all people sinners, seemed to have done harm. But when the Lord Jesus Christ came, he forgave to all people the sin which no one could avoid. And, by the shedding of his own blood, he blotted out the handwriting that was against us. This is what he says in Romans 5.20, The law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Because after the whole world became subject, Christ took away the sin of the whole world, as John testified, saying in John 1.29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And for this reason, let no one boast about works, because no one is justified by his deeds. But he who is righteous has righteousness given to him because he was justified from the washing of baptism. Faith, therefore, is that which frees through the blood of Christ, because he is blessed, whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Psalm 32, 1. These are the words of Ambrose, which clearly favor our doctrine. He denies justification to works and teaches that faith sets us free through the blood of Christ. Let all the commentators on the sentences, who are adorned with magnificent titles, be collected into one heap. For some are called angelic, others subtle, and others unanswerable, that is, doctors who cannot err. When all these have been read and reread, they will not be worth half as much for understanding Paul as is this one passage of Ambrose. In the same way, Augustine writes many things against the Pelagians, and on the Spirit in the letter, he says, The righteousness of the law, that he who has fulfilled the law shall live in it, is set forth for this reason. When anyone is recognized as weakness, he may attain and do the law and live in it, reconciling the justifier, not by his own strength, nor by the letter of the law itself, which cannot be done, but by faith. In a justified person, there is no right work by which... He who does that work may live, but justification is received by faith. Here Augustine clearly says that the justifier is reconciled by faith and that justification is received by faith. A little after. By the law we fear God, by faith we hope in God. But to those fearing punishment, grace is hidden. And the soul laboring under this fear resorts by faith to God's mercy, in order that he may give what he commands. Here he teaches that hearts are terrified by the law, but they receive consolation by faith. He also teaches us to receive mercy by faith before we try to fulfill the law. We will quote certain other passages shortly. The adversaries reject this teaching. Truly, it is amazing that the adversaries are in no way moved by so many passages of Scripture which clearly credit justification to faith. Indeed, Scripture denies this ability to works. Do they, think that at, at, do they think that the same point is repeated so often for no purpose? Do they think that these words fell thoughtlessly from the Holy Spirit? But they have also come up with sophisticated tricks by which they escape these passages. They say that these passages of Scripture that speak of faith ought to be received as referring to faith that has been formed, fides formata. This means they do not credit justification to faith except on account of love. Yes, they do not credit justification to faith in any way but only to love because they dream that faith could coexist with mortal sin. Where does this go? 
They again abolish the promise and return to the law. If faith receives forgiveness of sins because of love, forgiveness of sins will always be uncertain, because we never love as much as we ought to. Indeed, we do not love unless our hearts are firmly convinced that forgiveness of sins has been granted to us. So the adversaries in forgiveness of sins and justification require confidence in one's own love. In this way, they completely abolish the gospel about free forgiveness of sins, although at the same time they do not offer this love or understand it, unless they believe that forgiveness of sins is freely received. We also say that love ought to follow faith, as Paul also says in Galatians 5.6, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Yes, we must not think that by confidence in this love or because of this love we receive forgiveness of sins and reconciliation, just as we do not receive forgiveness of sins because of other works that follow. But forgiveness of sins is received by faith alone. Indeed, this is properly called faith because the promise cannot be received except by faith. Faith, <laughs> properly called, is what believes this promise. Scripture speaks of this faith. Because faith receives forgiveness of sins and reconciles us to God, we are, like Abraham, counted as righteous for Christ's sake before we love and before we do the works of the law, although love necessarily follows. Nor indeed is this faith an idle knowledge, neither can it coexist with mortal sin. It is a work of the Holy Spirit by which we are freed from death and terrified minds are encouraged and brought to life. Because this faith alone receives forgiveness of sins, makes us acceptable to God, and brings the Holy Spirit, it could be more correctly called grace making one pleasing to God, gratia gratum faciens. It could not be called, in effect, following faith, i.e. love. In order that the subject might be made quite clear, we have shown well enough so far, both from testimonies of Scripture and arguments derived from Scripture, that we receive forgiveness of sins for Christ's sake through faith alone. We have shown that, through faith alone, we are justified, that is, unrighteous people are made righteous or regenerated. How necessary the knowledge of this faith is can be easily judged. Because Christ's office is recognized in this alone, we receive Christ's benefits by this alone. Only this teaching brings sure and firm consolation to pious minds. In the church, there must be the teaching by which the pious may receive the sure hope of salvation. For the adversaries give people bad advice when they tell them to doubt whether they receive forgiveness of sins. How will such persons sustain themselves in death who have heard nothing of this faith and think that they ought to doubt whether they receive forgiveness of sins? Besides, it is necessary that the gospel be kept in Christ's church, namely the promise that sins are freely forgiven for Christ's sake. Those who teach nothing of this faith we speak about completely abolish the gospel. But the scholastics mention not even a word about this faith. Our adversaries follow them and reject this faith, nor do they see that by rejecting this faith they abolish the entire promise about the free forgiveness of sins and the righteousness of Christ. Tomorrow evening we will begin Article 5, which is actually the longest article in the Apology. Uh, so we will be in that for uh, the better part, I would say, of a week and a half. We will talk about Article 5. Uh, possibly less, but I think it will probably take us a week and a half to get through that. We join in the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. 
Amen. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. God the Father in heaven, have mercy. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy. Be gracious to us, spare all the dying. From all sin, from all evil, from hell, the devil's might, from the devil's wiles, from your wrath and from hell's torment, from sudden and evil death, good Lord, deliver them. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the grace of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, help them, good Lord. In the hour of death, on the day of judgment, help them, good Lord. We poor sinners implore you to hear us, good Lord. To comfort all the dying, to forgive them all their sins, to lead them out of this misery into eternal life, we implore you to hear us, good Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we implore you to hear us. Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. O Christ, hear us. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, always more ready to hear than we are to pray, and to give more than we either desire or deserve, pour down upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things that we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.